not, not on camera. camera. You're live. Oh, well, uh, we're live. Babe. Not okay. Not well, live yet. Yes. It's, it's, it, we actually are. He pressed go. So oh. good morning, everybody. Uh, so you okay. can tell that we're definitely not rehearsed. Um, so here is me and Mrs. Dean in the kitchen at church having our... Uh, Bible study as if you guys were all sitting in front of us. I wish you were here But what a blessing that we can fellowship around the Word of God um, Even though we're a distance away um, It's not coming on my thing so I can't help you this so far. Okay. Oh wait. No, that's not wait. yet No, okay. keep talking. Um, I'm gonna keep talking <laughs> um, um I hope this is a blessing to you. The ladies' Bible study, if it's not something that you have previously attended, is normally here on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock in the morning, every other Tuesday. Uh, we Good meet morning. and we have the Good opportunity morning. to just open up the Word of God together, which for me has been such a blessing. I know for Mrs. Dean also. And um, the premise of this Bible study was not for me and Mrs. Dean to sit here and do actually what we're going to be doing here today, but for you ladies, for all of us together for a two-week period to take a subject, study it, find out what the Word of God has to say on that subject, things that were prevalent to us and or that came up in the discussion that we um, had that particular Bible study. And then when we gather back together, everybody share what it is that they found from the Word of God, and then talk about it as ladies. The Bible says that iron sharpeneth iron, and we, as the women of First Bible Church and as children of God, need to be able to use our Bible to encourage ourselves, to comfort ourselves, to teach our children, to be able to answer every man that asketh of the hope that's within us. And sometimes those questions um, are difficult. Sometimes it's just a matter of how to live as a mom, as a wife, and how to live in this world and be godly. And that was the purpose of this particular Bible study. Um, the last time that we met, um, the ladies got together and we discussed on why you should read your Bible. We hear our pastors often tell us that you need to be in the book, to be in the book, that that's the only way that you can yeah. grow and get to know your Savior. And that our Bible was given to us so that we could know the heart of our Savior. And so I asked the ladies, well, why? Why do you need to read the book? Is it just because our pastors tell us? Find out from the Word of God where it tells you that you are supposed to be reading your Bible. And then why did God tell you to read, read your Bible? What is it that he wanted you to know? And then as a uh, part of that particular study, one of our ladies brought up a verse in Hebrews regard, regarding um, a high priest, which was the um, premise for this particular study today. So I asked the ladies to go home and study, one, um, what is the role of a high priest, what was the role of the high priest in the Old Testament, and Jesus as our high priest today, what was his role, and what does he do? And... I hope you guys got a blessing out of it. Um, I'm going to just go over some of the things that I uh, studied and came up with, and I hope it blesses your heart. We're going to try to keep this. Normally, our ladies' Bible study goes about an hour and a half. We are <laughs> not going to sit here for an hour and a half, Lord willing. Um, but it should probably about a half an hour or so. And I hope that even if you don't get a chance to comment or if we don't get a chance to uh, go over whatever your comment might be, Maybe me and Mrs. Dean, if you have a question and during this live video, we don't get a chance to answer it, we can get back in touch with you during the week. Um, but I hope it blesses your heart. I hope it uh, encourages you to do further study. Um, so let's start with a quick word of prayer because I know I'm nervous and um, somebody told us to keep it real and unrehearsed. Well, <laughs> no problem with that one. Okay. Father, we come before you now, Lord, and I just thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, that you are the God of the universe, Lord, and that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, Lord. Thank you that all that we need to know is in your book, Lord, and, and that, Father, we can know you and have that relationship with you, Father, that would help us, Father, to have joy and peace and wisdom 
and that, Father, we can grow to be more like you. I pray that this study would be a blessing, Father, to the ladies that are listening, and that, Father, ultimately and at the end of the day, you would be honored and glorified from everything that comes out of our mouths, Lord. Help us, Father, not to say anything that would dishonor you, Lord, but I pray that you would be magnified and uplifted and that all men would be drawn to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for my dear sister, my friend, my my laborer together, Lord, my, my I don't know, Lord, Mrs. Dean is more than she knows to my heart, Lord, and I'm so grateful for her. Pray that you would just bless this time, Father, together, for it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then we're going to turn to some scriptures. Um, so first off, the priests in the Old Testament were chosen from the tribe of Levi. The sons of Levi were Gershon and Kohath and Merari, and each one were given a specific job required by God for them as um, a group to do both in the tabernacle, to carry the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then what they had to do as priests. There were many men, because it's a big tribe of Israel, a couple of million people, and so if they brought their sacrifices, it wasn't one sacrifice, there was many sacrifices, and it was daily. And so there was a lot of work for the priests to do, both for the people and both for the work within the tabernacle. And so there were many men that served in the tabernacle, helping with those sacrifices. However, there was only one high priest, and that high priest, the first one, was Aaron, and he was... Um, chosen by God, um, he could do the duties, the same duties that the priests themselves would do, but he was the only one. The priests could not do the job that the high priest did. Only Aaron was allowed in the Holy of Holies. There was only one person chosen specifically by God to enter into the, uh, before, into the Holy of Holies and to go before the mercy seat on behalf of the people. Now that's important. And some of these points as we go uh, further down in this study, you're going to see how you can see the Lord Jesus, even in the Old Testament, and how he prepared both his people and us for Jesus Christ as our high priest. Okay, so some basic facts. The priests had special clothes designed by God. You find the specifics of those clothing, of the clothing that the priests wore in Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 39 and Leviticus chapter 8. Now, I'm not going to go over that because that's not the premise of this study, but the clothing was important because you and I, coming before the Lord, have to be dressed in righteous clothing that we only get because we're saved. The priests had clothing designed by God um, that they had to wear before they could come into the service of the Lord. There were eight articles of clothing. Four were the same for all the priests, including the high priest. The high priest and all the priests wore four out of those eight clothing. It was their undergarments and uh, something wrapped around their waist. And that all the priests, including the high priest, wore. Before, that's a unique number, anyway. But four of the garments were unique only to the high priest. Um, in Exodus chapter 28, verse 2, you could write these things down just because I have them written, and so I don't know how to wait for you to turn to them, so I'm just going to read them. Anyway, it says in Exodus chapter 28, verse 2, that the garments were holy and that they were designed for glory and beauty. God had a purpose. Everything that God does under the sun has a purpose. There's nothing that's done by happen chance or outside of his wisdom or outside of his knowledge. Even the circumstances of today, God is fully aware of what's going on and has a plan. Anyway. The high priest, on two of these articles of his clothing, I'm just going to point out. Um, the high priest, there was a gold uh, plate that was put on the high priest's forehead. And it was attached to his forehead with blue lace. Again, because it was for beauty and for glory. And um, on the gold plate, it said, Holiness to the Lord. That was what was engraved on the plate, on the gold plate. I got a blessing out of this particular article of clothing because, all right, holiness to the Lord. I understand, and maybe you guys during your study came up with the same thing. Like, I understand why 
they needed to bring lambs and bullocks for sin, for iniquity, for just as an offering of thankfulness to the Lord. Um, but this particular article of clothing was to bear the iniquity of the holy things, of the things like the children of Israel would bring a lamb, a bullock, two turtle doves, depending on their uh, poverty, poverty level, um, whatever, or whatever the offering was that they were bringing, and that they would bring it to the priest to be offered. But this particular gold uh, plate was a sacrifice and an offering to the Lord on behalf of those holy things. Because even though the lamb and the sheep and, and the offerings had to be without outward blemishes, they still had iniquity within what our eyes, what their eyes could not see. So in order to bear the iniquity of the sacrifices that the children of Israel brought on behalf of their sin, Aaron, the high priest only, had this article of clothing on behalf of their sacrifices so that even though I'm coming to the priest to, because to have my sins forgiven, to bring it before God and be right with the Lord, the offering that I'm bringing is not clean. It could never be clean because it's here on this earth, which is cursed with sin. And so the high priest um, had this garment and um, on behalf of the hallowed things that the children of Israel would bring. And here's what it made me think of. In the Word of God, it talks about um, those holy things are the offerings brought by the people. Um, these would always have some iniquity attached to them, some imperfection, perfection, owing to the imperfection. It's kind of like a picture of our imperfection. And what the Lord gave me is that my righteousness, those children of Israel came before the tabernacle with the intention to be right with the Lord. But that was their righteousness. That was their works. And they were being obedient to God and God accepted it for the time. But my Bible tells me in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now I want you to hold on to this particular point, because when we start talking about the Lord Jesus as our high priest, this is important because back in the Old Testament, the role of the high priest was to be obedient to the law. God gave Moses the law, not 10 commandments. There was over 600 uh, laws that God had given the children of Israel for worship, for the tabernacle, moral law, for them to communicate with each other, civil law, and uh, so that the people could dwell together with God. Um, anyway, lost my train of thought. Definitely not everything. <laughs> anyway, trying to, I'm trying okay. to multitask, <laughs> listen to you, and read this at the same time. But I got my coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, that was important, and I got a blessing out of that. That even back in the Old Testament, there's nothing new under the sun. They brought their perfect outwardly, uh, no blemish. Nothing to the eyes that man could see was wrong with this sacrifice. But to God, who looks on the inward man, God even had to make preparations for that. So that when you and I look back at the Old Testament, it goes right across to the Word of God. Anyway, that was one article of clothing. Okay, the second article of clothing that I thought was really interesting and important was that the high priest bore the names of the children of Israel on, the, on his breastplate. They had this ephod on, he had a dress. I actually have a picture. It's not a very good picture, but I hope you can see it. Anyway, uh, he's the high priest. It's a picture I downloaded. And on his chest, he has, um, it's like an apron. Um, and on it is 12 stones, all different stones. We're not even gonna go into that. But it represented the 12 tribes of Israel, which was the whole nation of Israel. And the high priest bore the names of the children of Israel on the breastplate of judgment upon his heart, the Bible says, when he went into the holy place for a memorial. So even back in the Old Testament, under the law, God's heart was a part of reconciling and, and fellowshipping with his people. 
He loves us. He loves us as we are. He knows we're sinners. He knows that we can't get to him on our own. And even back under the law, he made preparation for his people and for you and I when we read the Old Testament so that we can see how blessed and how perfect Jesus Christ is. Because ultimately, that's what his goal is, is for you and I to know who the Lord Jesus is and how to have a relationship with him. Okay, so that was kind of some basic facts that I had. Uh, also, in order for the priest, the high priest and the regular priests to minister in the temple, it says in Exodus chapter 29, verses 1 through 27. No, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> but I want you to write it down so you can look at it for yourself. But I just summarized what it is. In order for them to even enter into the tabernacle, uh, the priests, first they had to wash. They had to wash. They had to wash their whole bodies. They had to be clean outwardly. Then they had to put on the garments that God had prepared for them. They had to dress properly. And then they were anointed with oil um, with their clothes, once they had the priestly garments on. Then they were anointed with oil. And then a sacrifice was made because although, and this is the third point that I think is really important that I want you to hold on to for when we get to talking about Jesus Christ as our high priest. A sacrifice was made because although the priests were chosen by God, it was the Levites, it was the tribe, God had set down the rules as far as what he wanted them to do, and even as far as what he wanted them to wear, they weren't sinless. They had to, before they could work on behalf of the people, they had to offer a sacrifice for themselves. Exodus chapter 29 verse 1 states that fact. Um, I'm actually going to turn to that. I have my computer open. So just, I think that's a really good verse to read. It says, and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hollow them. That means to make them holy before God. To minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. And it's the first thing that God says in that chapter, even though it's not the first thing that they had to do, but it's the first thing that God says. And then he tells them about washing and getting dressed and being anointed with oil and then he tells them what sacrifices and how to make the sacrifices and where to put the blood because the bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins okay so that's in order for this priest this man aaron and his sons and the tribe of levi to come before god and minister in the tabernacle this is what they had to do okay so let's continue as far as some information on the high priest if the priest sinned which they did a priest was not only not sinless when they were chosen, but they would sin during their lifetime. God knew that they were no different than the people that they were ministering to. They just had a different job, a different responsibility chosen by God for that particular tribe to do. Um, but they were going to continue to sin. And in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3 through 12, it gives um, the specifics so that if a priest was to sin, or when he sinned, what his responsibility was before he could come and minister in the house of God. He had to go and get right and come before God with the same offerings that the people did, only he was the one who made the offering, and that was the difference. But the fact that a priest is not sinless is important. The fact that they had to continually come before God on a regular basis. So if I sinned on Monday, and then I sinned again on Friday. My offering on Monday didn't cover my sin on Friday. I had to come back and make it right. If it was uh, especially something that I know I broke one of the commandments. But how merciful of God, I thought this was also a blessing, of God who provided for his sin the priests to be cleansed also. Isn't that cool? I mean, you would think that God would have held them up to a different standard, but he knew who they were. He knew they were never going to be sinless. And so... Um, he provided a way for them to be right with God. I don't know. This study just made me love my Savior even more. Um, God never made it seem that the earthly priest doing the work of God was any different than the rest of the people. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says all. It doesn't matter who we are. Every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Back in the Old Testament, God made a way for them to be right with him until the point that Jesus Christ died. And all they needed to do was to have faith and be obedient back in the Old Testament. And then they waited 
for a period of time until Jesus Christ died and did what God required uh, from mankind so that we could all go to heaven. Okay, so then what was the chief priest's responsibility? Okay, so we know some basic principles, so some basic facts about the priests, what tribe, how they were chosen, uh, in order for them to minister, what did they have to do, um, and if they sinned, did they could they be right with God? And so then what was their job as the Old Testament was concerned? Okay, one, the high priest, um, his responsibility was he was overseer of all the rest of the priests. He was basically, you know, the commander-in-chief. <laughs> um, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 11 is where you'll find that. God had the high priest and he was in charge, basically, of uh, making sure that they were doing right, making sure that if they, they needed to be living right, um, they needed to be held accountable. And so the high priest was the person to whom they were held accountable. He made sure they carried out exactly what God wanted them to do. Um, two, only the high priest could wear the Urim and the Thummim. That's in Numbers chapter 27, verse 21. Again, that's a study I hope you'll do by yourself because otherwise we'll be here forever studying that. Um, but it was an engraved dice-like kind of stones, if you will, used to determine truth or falsity. And for this reason, the Hebrew people uh, would go to the high priest in order to know the will of God. And that's another point that's important. So in order for the children of Israel to know if they should go to war or what they were supposed to do, they would go to the high priest and the high priest would come before God and he would be the one to say truth or falsity and to know what God's will was for their life. And the people of Israel knew that if they went to the high priest, they could know what the will of God was. Um, the high priest also had to offer a sin offering not only for the sins of the whole congregation, but also for himself. He was the mediator that's important, between the nation of Israel and God. He was the only one who can go into the Holy of Holies and hear what God had to say. And the most important duty of the high priest, and no priest, only the high priest could do this, and it was required of him to do, but the most important duty of the high priest was to conduct the service on the Day of Atonement. The tenth day of the seventh month of the year, only he was allowed to enter into the most holy place behind the veil to stand before God. Having made a sacrifice for himself and for the people, he then brought the blood into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, um, God's throne. This is in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 through 15. It's probably in other places, but at least this way you could look that up. Again, that's Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 through 15. He did this to make atonement for himself and the people for all their sins committed during the year just ended, Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. It is this particular service that is compared to the ministry of Jesus as our high priest, which you will find in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Now that's just a brief overview of what the high priest's job was to do. Um, there's mine. Sorry, I couldn't find my papers. I wanted you guys to look those verses up because in order to appreciate how wonderful my Savior is and all the fat, all that he held to that was required because he was, he was a Jewish man. And he, until he died, he was still basically under the law. As a Jew, he had to follow what the law had to say. And as our high priest, he was obedient to what God asked him to do. So, I could go on about the Lord Jesus and about him being our high priest, and me and Mrs. Dean could probably sit here, have coffee, talk amongst ourselves for three hours, but I narrowed it down to a couple of things that I thought you ladies would get a blessing out, a blessing out of. Anyway, one, Jesus Christ was chosen of God, just like the Levitical priesthood. That was the tribe out of the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel that God, that, uh, his nation, he chose the tribe of Levi for the priests to come out of. Jesus Christ chose, uh, God rather chose Jesus Christ to be his high priest, um, to be our high priest. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and I'm going to read it. You can write that down. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Throughout the whole Old Testament, you see prophecies that Jesus Christ was going to come, that he was going to be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, um, that he was going to be bruised, Isaiah 53, that he was going on our behalf, that, I mean, you see Jesus Christ through the whole Old Testament of what his what he was going to come and do for you and I. Anyway, chosen of God, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God sent those angels down because he knew, and they were excited, the angels were excited that the people of earth were now going to be reconciled to God for the first time since the Garden of Eden. We were going to be able to have fellowship with God one-on-one, -on -one have a sweet relationship with him, just one-on-one, -on -one because Jesus Christ was born. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right after the sin in the garden, God prophesied that he was going to take care of us and that a Savior was going to come. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that's a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so even in Genesis chapter 3, right at the beginning, God's telling us that his son is going to come and die for us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. And this, this is a great verse. Um, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus was chosen. He was chosen of God because we needed a high priest. I could not get to heaven on my own. I could not satisfy what, God, what God's requirements were. Two, he wasn't just chosen. He volunteered for the, God, for the job. The Levites, were, they were drafted into service. Aaron was drafted into service. But my Savior volunteered for the job. It says in Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. So you know he's talking about Jesus. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those heathens that God came to die for. He, he said, I'll give you, Margaret, on it for your inheritance. And Jesus Christ took me. And if you're saved, then you're part of that inheritance too. This is interesting. He was not from the tribe of Levi, though. That Levitical priesthood ended when Jesus Christ became the high priest. And he was from the tribe of Judah after the order of Melchizedek. And again, we're not going to study Melchizedek. He is a priest named in the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. It says Psalm one to, in Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was before Abraham. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't part of the 12 tribes. And Jesus Christ was a high priest after that. And Jesus Christ came from the lineage of Judah, um, from the lion from the tribe of Judah. That's where he was from. He was sinless. My Savior could satisfy what God required because he did not need a sacrifice made for himself. He was sinless. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He put on earthly flesh so that he can look at, look at us and say, I know what you're going through. I know how that feels. He's not a high priest that's just aloof and doesn't understand your heartache, your tears, your fears. He says, With time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. He put verses in there that deal with the fact that we're humans and have flesh and have sin because he understood what we would need. I would need for him to comfort me when I cried. He said he came to heal the brokenhearted because my heart was going to be broken at sometimes, just like yours. He's not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and was without sin and was yet without sin. Jesus Christ was born sinless. He didn't have a, he was born body, soul, and spirit. He was born without sin, and he never sinned throughout his whole life and was obedient unto death, the Bible says, obedient even unto the cross. Wherefore God gave him a name which is above every name, 
Nobody else ever born on this world was like my Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, but here's the cool part. Because he was sinless, he was accepted of God, God looked at his sacrifice and he accepted of God to be the perfect sacrifice that satisfies all of God's demands to reconcile us to him, all mankind to him. That if thou shalt, um, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus Christ's sacrifice and payment and obedience to the law and sinless, sinlessness made his sacrifice perfect. Perfect. And God accepted his sacrifice. And because of that, God could put that verse in Romans that says whosoever. Because now it doesn't matter what nationality, what religion, where we come from. All God wants to know is what did you do with my Savior who just satisfied everything that you can't satisfy on your own. He became that high priest for us on behalf of for you and I to mediate between God and man. And his, because God was satisfied, all men can come to God. And because he was sinless, there doesn't need to be any more sacrifice. In the Old Testament, now, if you could open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, because I want you to see this yourself, verse 1. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. I'm going to turn there too, so that I'll assume it takes you that long to get to that same verse, uh, the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, says, almost there, um, for the law having a shadow, it was a picture, God wanted us to see something, a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the, of the things, can never with those which they offered year by year. In other words, the priest came year by year. I just gave you the verses to look up to offer a sacrifice to atone for the people to keep them in fellowship with God. Okay, but that had to be done year by year because the offering itself was not perfect. God had to have garments on the high priest because the offering itself was not perfect. The priest was not perfect. He himself sinned and the people continuously so this, the offering and the sacrifice had to be offered year by year continually, make the comers, those that came to the temple, temple, thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the offering was perfect, then wouldn't it once have been enough? But once wasn't enough, they had to come yearly because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. I can't wash them away through baptism. I can't wash them away through coming to the temple with sacrifices. That's all outward and it does nothing to change the heart. That's why the perfect lamb that the children of Israel would bring for their sin atonement Without, with no blemish, it was the right weight, it was the right age, it meant everything that the law required. But inwardly, it wasn't perfect. And that's why we needed a perfect high priest. So the blood of bulls and of goats could not take away those sins for forever. Now look at verse 11. Same chapter, chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. And every, high, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, you know, I don't know about you, but I have those besetting sins that I ask God to forgive me today, and then tomorrow I do the same thing, and I have to ask them all over again. Thank you, Lord, that I am forgiven for yesterday, today, and tomorrow's sins, and I have my name written in permanent ink because just like the children of Israel, I would have had to come because my same sins repeat themselves. But every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, I have eternal security because my high priest paid for my sins once perfectly, satisfied everything that God required. My Bible tells me forever. And then he sat down because his work for my salvation was done 
on the right hand of God. From henceforth, from that point on, expecting till his enemies, enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's it. One sacrifice. Jesus Christ, our high priest, once for all men, paid the price. He died on the cross because the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. He went to hell because the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. But then he overcame death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? The grave has no more in 1 Corinthians 15. It has no more sting. It has no more victory. Jesus Christ satisfied and he overcame death. And so now I have eternal life because he rose again from the grave. I don't know if that doesn't make you want to just jump up and down and shout and get excited. I don't know. <laughs> well, and here's the cool thing. I don't need any man here today. He's the only priest I need. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses um, 5 and 6, it says, For there is one God and one mediator. The Old Testament, it was one high priest. Then he would die and they would need a new one. And then he would die and they would need a new one. Well, my Savior conquered death and lives forever in heaven. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And that's the man Christ Jesus. One mediator. He is my mediator. Who gave himself a ransom. He gave himself. They didn't take his life. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He said in John chapter 10 and then, I'm going to end here, and I don't know if we have any questions or any comments that people have made, or if Mrs. Dean, since I just rambled away, it says in John chapter 10, verse 18, no man taketh it from me. This is Jesus talking. No man could take his life. He said, but I lay it down of myself. He gave his life willingly. He let them beat him and crucify him and nail him to a cross for you, for me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What a great study. What an absolute wonderful thing to just sit down and learn, I don't know, just how wonderful my Savior and all that he's done for you and for I. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or any... No, they're just, we have, it seems like there's like so far 58, if I'm reading this new gizmo thing, right? Uh, a lot of thank yous, a lot of praise in the Lord. Awesome. Um, thank you, ladies. Praise the Lord. Uh, good morning. Uh, a lot of people are watching. Okay. Do you have anything that you had studied that, or that I just oh, no, rambled and covered at all? No, you did. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm trying to... Okay. My, my, new, oops, my new normal is trying to get the figure out what's going on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Trying so, to listen to you <laughs> and get this... Well, this is definitely it, coffee with Debbie and Margaret this morning. Fine as we go along here. <laughs> yeah, so we'll meet again, Lord willing, if this virus keeps us stuck. Um, we'll meet again, 10 o'clock, here in the kitchen. Hope you have your coffee. Uh, maybe me and Mrs. Dean, um, I don't know. I'll probably be just as nervous, sweating, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but I hope you guys got a blessing out of that. The study for... Uh, next time that you ladies can look up and if you have any questions sorry to mm -hmm. just change gears there text us ask us if there was anything that you studied that you wanted to share I think you can post it on uh, this feed I'm not sure because I'm Facebook illiterate thank you Bobby for your help is this once a month is the first question by Patty no, no. every two weeks so two weeks from today to, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after we will meet again. And our study, I think, will be um, why do you need to hide God's word in your heart? And we went over about reading God's word, but you need to memorize God's word. And so I want you to find some scripture just about hiding God's word in your heart and about why and the necessity what is it that is the necessity? I want you to study that. Yes, and then, once every two weeks. And then we'll go from there. I don't know what the date it's is. Next but... Thursday at 10? No. Tuesday. Next Tuesday at 10? No. Next Tuesday? Not, and that's 14 days from today. I don't know what that date is. Yeah, but 14 is days on? from today, on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the kitchen at First Bible Church. 
Okay, ladies, have a blessed day. And we're praying for you. Pray for us. Pray for one another.